Orr, who is going to be talking to us about her amazing Sarah Bowditch project. Um, she's the Buchanan Chair in French at St. Andrews and the first woman to actually hold that chair, which is really wonderful. And um, Mary's background is in French studies, but really combining literature, history, history of science and, and being um, really uh, transnational too in her focus. So um, not bounded um, within particular discipline or a particular geography. Um, and it's a real pleasure to have you joining us today, Mary. Um, so I will hand over to you and um, look forward to hearing about your project. Thank you very much. And I'm just going to start uh, with the moment in research uh, that is pressing send. And whether you've just submitted your PhD thesis, which we know um, Ellen has just done, or your first academic article, or your first or a subsequent monograph to a publisher, it's always a good time for significant reflection. So my thanks go to Sasha, Ben, Ellen and CHPSTM for this first opportunity to reflect on the 15 year interdisciplinary adventure that culminates in the first major monograph on Sarah's works now on my publisher's desk. The polymathic contents of this double weighted output in ref terms is not my main subject today. I want to focus instead on monograph proportioned interdisciplinary research projects as a process for the lone scholar undertaking them, precisely because such work neither fits nor is accommodated readily in UK university disciplines, ref and funding council descriptor boxes. Why I think alternative research and researcher models matter for our disciplines is a larger question for discussion later. The fundamental question of my paper, therefore, is not the why, but the how interdisciplinary research matters for intellectual endeavour. My best way of encapsulating the difference is the famous it growed in my title and as understood in the original context of its speaker Topsy. They're from Harriet Beecher Stowe's abolitionist novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, appearing first in serial form in 1851 and as a two volume work in 1852 on both sides of the Atlantic. Topsy's the much misquoted but little talked of slave girl, allegedly the stereotypical piccaninny, who is asked by her concerned white adult owner teaching her about God, who's asked who made her. Topsy replies, and I quote, nobody as I knows on, I spect I growed, don't think nobody never made me. In the context of the novel and its white readers, Topsy's growth can only be by plan or design, whether by God or the controls of civilizing mission, to keep in check her uncontrolled and uncontrollable growing nonetheless. The astute Topsy today might then turn her Spect I growed answer into the question, do you think you growed your research? However you reply to her, what then of your free will or your predestination choices concerning it? Do you choose to make your research fit the standard growth plan for proper PhD and UK ref research outputs? Or do you make your plan as befits topsy-like growing inquiry? And if you take the second, how do you undertake such guaranteed uncontrollability? I'm a professor of 19th century French literature and science, as Sasha kindly described me. I never set out to study Sarah Bowditch. In 2005, I was working at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France on an earlier monograph published in 2008 on religion and science in Flaubert's 1874 uh, work, The uh, Tentation Saint Antoine, The Temptation of Saint Anthony. My major new supposition was that its clash of religious, philosophical and scientific ideas at the time of the fourth century Saint Anthony was a prism for similar 19th century French natural scientific ideas and their heresies. 
To unlock the parallels, I was researching the works of Georges Cuvier, but had yet to crack Flaubert's sphinx and chimera scene in his text, as his reworking of the famous quarrel of the analogues in 1830 between Cuvier and um, Etienne Geoffroy Saint-Hilaire concerning species extinctions or change. For inspiration, I I keyed Cuvier once more into the BNF library catalogue to trawl again through his chronologically ordered works. As before, I passed over his 1826 Excursion dans les îles de Madère et de Porto Santo, when suddenly the title commanded my full attention. But Cuvier never travelled to Madeira. How could he be the catalogued author? Out of curiosity, I called up the text to find out, and here is what I saw um, on the inside uh, title page, and it's on, the French is on your left. And I wonder, can you spot where, where Cuvier is, where his name is? It's in the smallest print above Paris, as the author of notes to the text. My astonishment was, was then also to see Alexander von Humboldt's name in apposition. These two leading figures in French museum science and scientific exploration, respectively, are clearly contributing to a work authored not by T.E. Bowditch, but rather by his wife, widow Madame Bowditch. From my subject specialist knowledge of both barons, their triangulation with Madame Bowditch immediately identify her authorship and publication of the excursions as momentous for their very existence in France in 1826, let alone for her scientific contributions. Who was this translated British woman author? From my BNF reading room, I did an immediate cross check with the online British Library catalogue. Up came Mrs. Bowditch, author of The Excursions in London with Whitaker in 1825, and you've got the inside title page on the right. The English original clearly has no notes. But the French title page held further key scientific information for me. I knew that Levo published all Cuvier's multi-volume works on natural history, as well as the official transactions of the Paris Museum of Natural History. The French Excursions was therefore no minor publication. If I had just found myself an intriguing new analogue project, the most unusual connections of Madame Bowditch to both Cuvier and Humboldt were clearly central to her work. I had first to finish my Flaubert book um, before I could address how major this text might be in both its languages of publication. It had doubly growed before my eyes. So what do you do with a misfitting Topsy project? I knew um, that it defied Anglophone and Francophone history of science of the period and scholarship on women and on gender in science. I could have ignored it because it was clearly not part of UOA French and modern languages studies, despite the more social sciences space at Southampton, where I was also at Modern Languages Director of Research and REF 2014 lead. Interdisciplinary outputs were also to be flagged in uh, for the uh, 2014 REF as special cases for panel cross-referral, making them uh, hostages to fortune. Yet it was precisely my discipline-specific expertise in 19th century French literature and natural sciences that had immediately identified the importance of my subject. Did the problem lie less in the interdisciplinarity of Madame Bodich and more in the narrowness of institutional ref and funding council parameters? Was the pitch of transnational studies the route to take, uh, especially as Southampton's modern languages was among its earliest proponents, since comparative history of science and comparative literature and science research were unthought of under comparative literature? My director of research advice to self was not to take this transnational studies route, and for pragmatic reasons. This subject designation was not an option in AHRC and other funding council application drop-down boxes. 
I was starting to see that my new larger research thinking, as well as my Mrs. B project, and I'm going to call it that because it's my pet name for it all the way through, was being grown. In 2009, my four official French studies outputs were in the bag for REF 2014. The larger risk to my research was not to follow up Mrs. B in light of my now published monograph on, Cuvier's, um, on uh, Flaubert's Cuvier and Humboldt. What I had to do was to make opportunity and work out next how to make funding council schemes and drop down discipline descriptor boxes fit my interdisciplinary project. And I had to work out how the project better connected methodologically and academically with my 19th century French studies expertise and publications. In short, if the bridges and foundations were missing, I had first to construct them as a setting in which to conduct my Mrs B research proper. So alongside my standard publications in French literary cultural studies, I gave some half dozen invited research papers in different disciplinary and learned society settings on Sarah's early natural history works, and I published on women in Cuvier circles at the Paris Museum. And I also made some strategic decisions on what I was going to exclude from my Mrs B project. The most important was to establish, to establish her corpus proper, and I chose to start it because uh, uh, with the excursions in both editions, because they are her first clearly so authored publications. Her earlier collaborations with her husband in his many Paris publications from 1819 to 1804, uh, 1824 certainly funded their independent scientific exploration uh, to Sierra Leone, which was in fact ab aborted by his death in the Gambia in 1824, which um, was mentioned on that title page. These were but a preparatory part of her larger st story. Similarly, and although botany is among Sarah's expert interests in the excursions, I chose to concentrate instead on her many contributions to natural history as a less, a less feminised sphere of scientific interest. Through my new track record of publications in what I now call bridge and foundations domains, I then made my case to the Leverhulme Trust for a two year research fellowship to research a remarkable woman in science, Sarah Bowditch Lee from French scientific points of view. My project growed thanks to the Trust's award in 2010 to 12, so that I could undertake serious study for the first time of Sarah's English and French natural history works. I went to archives and libraries in Cambridge, Oxford, Birmingham, London, Paris, Washington, Yale, Philadelphia, Perth, Western Australia, among others, following Sarah's footsteps in her singularly polymathic and multi-genre corpus. My own biggest research growth spurts came from taking seriously the appendices and notes to the French excursions. Sarah's work on the fishes of West Africa is where Cuvier's notes all occur. Her parts in the Bowditch's new geological ex explorations of Madeira, including her scientific uh, illustrations, elicit um, Humboldt's extensive epilogue essay as his expert response to their work. If I was still nowhere near a monograph project, I had nonetheless begun to scope its eventual shape. Very specifically for the Leverhulme Fellowship, and here is another learning lesson, I committed myself to, and I quote, at least one major article arising from its research. Less is often more when strategically defined, since I was by now expecting to be growed by the magnitude of Sarah's contributions. The factor of her, of her unusual scientific life and Paris training under the very different Cuvier and Humboldt in 1819 to 1822 was also helping me to understand her work as at least their scientific peer.
And I'm just very briefly going to um, put up a list of the growing track record um, that uh, was that one major article uh, from my, my lever Hume, uh, only to um, gloss the highlighter in grey as my different ref um, submissions. Uh, the publication topics in blue as still no closer to AHRC drop down boxes uh, for grant applications, uh, but also uh, the different peer reviewed journals in yellow uh, as the places to um, to which I was learning to pitch my work in very different um, disciplinary and interdisciplinary subject domains. Like uh, Sarah before me, and I just refer to um, what is the third from the bottom uh, item on this list. Um, uh, the Burham Slave uh, is a gift book um, story. Sarah wrote gift book stories to fund her serious scientific publications. Um, so like Sarah before me, I too was funding my accrued institutional research leave time to draft draft chapters um, for my eventual book on her. Along alongside my uh, completing my official work in uh, French 19th century literary and cultural studies. By the time of my move in 2016 to St Andrews to the Buchanan chair, uh, the two strands of my research were now the stimulus, the one for the other. And I have to say in ways that uh, neither separately could ever have grown. But had my Mrs B project now grown too much? so as to be out of all proportion to a viable monograph project. Lockdown and being locked out from too long from my St Andrews University office, containing my wall long row of box files of irreplaceable Bowditch archive research, was the final straw that spurred a monograph proposal and its writing to the finish line. But the major question remained, how best could I pitch it to allow the magnitude of Sarah's story to come out? It still defied AHRC drop down boxes. Would an eye wateringly competitive British Academy Senior Research Fellowship fit its spec I growed pedigree? I had nothing to lose and a very much bigger research track record than Sarah on my side to gain. One of my longest standing research critical friends in modern languages and trans transnational studies, as it happens, gave my application the once over. Mary, he said, I think it's a winner, but only if you put front and top the project USPs. Specify all the differences. USPs, for those in the room who are not familiar, uh, unique selling points. My research friends in the room do not be afraid of nailing the blooming obvious if you want your project to bloom. There was then no little irony that I was co-hosting an international 19th century French studies on, uh, conference online in March 2021 when the British Academy's email arrived in my inbox, informing me that I was the recipient of one of only 10 senior research fellowships. The even greater surprise was to learn in May 2021 that the monograph project Sarah Bowditch Lee, pioneering natural, uh, French natural science from below, had been awarded the British Academy Donald Winch Fund Senior Research Fellowship in Intellectual History. Intellectual History is, of course, an AHRC drop down box category. Yet it was one I had never applied to my work or to myself as a scholar. I growed afresh thanks to the gifting by the anonymous uh, British Academy peer reviewers of intellectual history as the home of my project and the prism for its revised proposal as Sarah Bowditch Lee and pioneering perspectives in natural history, which is forthcoming in July. And I'm going to show you two slides on the table of contents, partly because I can't fit them all into the one slide, uh, but I want them to also show forth in that way the, the um, connections with Cuvier and Humboldt from the very first slide. So the first two sections have two parts. It's a three part um, work. The first canvassing Cuvier, and I'll let you just briefly uh, look at the chapter titles uh, and the second part harnessing Humboldt. 
And you'll see the USPs are a first, a first, a first, a foremost. I haven't forgotten my friend's advice. And then the second um, part of the table of contents um, brings together Cuvier and Humboldt in their um, joint commitments to scientific pedagogy, dissemination of science to wider audiences and to science. And usually for the time for both men, they believed that it had no sex. And I also have um, nine um, appendices, uh, which rather mirrors her excursions to Madeira. So all nine chapters um, build on the me methodological foundations, but not the contents of my earlier publications. And each uh, chapter um, brings different aspects, pioneering aspects of her corpus to light. But in order to understand their larger contributions in part one to the nascent field of ichthyology, that is fish studies, in part two to early anthropology in the field in West Africa before the discipline was birthed, and in part three to scientific intermediality and knowledge transfer. My monograph has therefore grown into very much more than a first transnational history of natural history in the early European 19th century, including more specifically by a woman in its fields. Sarah's forgotten published works from 1825 to 1856, hiding in plain sight in two languages, are, th are therefore lessons for how we may better identify, enlarge and transform cross-cultural history of science research as intellectual history. In the very different points on the left of this slide are the different ways in which Sarah's works, work and works defy the one size fits all um, models for national natural history making and its eminent makers. But Sarah's travelled natural science texts in terms of their fauna contents, their geographies, their genre and their media are also very much more than bi or multilingual encounters in a contact zone to reiterate Mary Louise Pratt's important 1994 term. The contact zone always defers to European scientific metrocentric authorities. So on the right of this slide are therefore the hows of Sarah's work as larger contributions that redraw the intellectual histories of study of pre-1850 natural history. Her pioneering perspectives are then in the terms in bold on the right of, of this slide. They are important modes of undertaking interdisciplinary research inquiry more generally outsiders, central figures, non-conformists, being bifocal, uh, and a larger uh, scoping for the um, scientific book. Since time presses, what in conclusions are my best bit tips for interdisciplinary topsy research? First, first impressions and immediate curiosity questions are rarely wrong. From first epiphany to monograph, this project has taught me to be growed in ways that I could never have imagined or self-constructed. And second, to have open curiosity to explore such a project um, then means serious attention to the hows of research. They inevitably require new ways of working, uh, working with alternative voices, forms, paths, perspectives and paradigms for what sci scientific knowledge is rather than what history of science research has hitherto largely demarcated it to be. So I will stop there on a provocative note. Thank you for your attention and for your questions.